Will the congregation please stand? Welcome. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Welcome to this service of the celebration of the life of Jean Smith Howard, a life well lived, a life lived as wife and mother and grandmother, sister and aunt, one who loved music, one who cherished friends, one who was very active in this church and one that touched so many, many lives. And so it is good that we have gathered here this morning to celebrate her life together. We come together in the very presence of God to witness to our faith as we celebrate Jean Howard's life. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, in death, resurrection. Hear these words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, because I live, you shall live also. Jean very carefully chose the music for our service today. She loved our opening hymn, Morning Has Broken, number 145. There are hymnals on the pews in front of you. Let us stand as we sing.
Please be seated. One of the many ways Jean was active here in the church was our Wednesday night contemplative service. And many times we begin that service with uh, words to center our hearts and minds in Christ. And Jean wanted those words used this morning. As you see, they are responsive. By day, God's steadfast love surrounds us at night. God's song is the music of our soul. How shall I behold the face of the living God? In hope, for our help comes from the Lord. So now please join with me in the prayer of, com the prayer of comfort. The Lord be with you and also with you. Loving God, you shared with us the life of Jean Howard. Give us now also your grace that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and of death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live so that living or dying our life may be in you, and that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. For literally centuries now, people of faith have turned to the scriptures for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. Three of Jean's grandchildren are going to read our scripture. I believe that they are the eldest of the grandchildren in each of the respective children's. So if you would come. Reagan and Morgan and Ashland. A reading from Romans, chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or, die, or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. A reading from Psalm 100. Shout triumphantly to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with celebration. Come before him with shouts of joy. Know that the Lord is God. He made us, we belong to him. We are his people, the sheep of his own pasture. Enter his gates with thanks. Enter his courtyards with praise. Thank him, bless his name. Because the Lord is good, his loyal love lasts forever. His faithfulness lasts generation after generation. A reading from Psalms chapter 28, verses 6 through 7. Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart great, greatly rejoice, and with my song I will praise him. And another reading from Psalms, chapter 104, verses 33. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Reagan Morgan and Ashlyn, thank you for sharing God's word with us this morning. I believe that when a loved one dies, God gives us special gifts, sacred gifts of memories and remembrances because that helps keep a person alive in our hearts and in our minds. And so it's going to be important to say Jean's name to remember her stories and to share them, not only this morning, but in all the days to come. 
but on behalf of the family, son Reggie Howard is coming now to share some family remembrances with us. So Reggie. First of all, I just want to thank everyone for coming. This is uh, overwhelming to see this many people for my mom, and I really appreciate it. I want to thank my aunts and uncles and my cousins who were able to come. Um, it meant a lot to us, and it was, able, it was great to see you all last night to catch up and had a great time. Um, my mother had uh, been planning her funeral for about the last, I think, 10 or 15 years, if I can remember correctly. And um, she had a big list about what she wanted, and uh, as Reverend McPhail said, that she had a lot of songs. I think there were probably about 30 that she had to have in her in the funeral, and luckily we were able to cut that down a little bit. But um, she had written me a letter, and she had asked that I, uh, that I was, that if I would come and speak on her behalf, and uh, of course I did, but if anyone knows my mother, she's very, um, she, she tells you exactly what she wants you to do. Um, she told me strictly what I was to say and where I was not allowed to say. Um, she told me that if I speak longer, or, or when she asked me, she had, asked, she had said, you did a great job at your dad's funeral, but you spoke way too long. And if there is anything over 10 minutes, we well, need to cut it off. So if, if it lasts longer than 10 minutes, can you please play some music so I'll know. Um, <laughs> You know, I have been trying to think about how best to describe my mother and, and just some of the words that uh, my sisters and I, the last couple of days um, of her life, we were able to spend a lot of time with her. And we uh, talked over a lot of stories and words that really describe her. And some of the ones that we had come up with was a fighter. She was a Southern lady. She had a voracious writer and a reader, very blunt, but passionate, the biggest warrior you'd ever see, protective, big on embellishment, especially when it was about her kids or her grandchildren. She was selfless, generous, and especially when she had very little, she always put others before her. Music was her first love, and as you will hear um, from her sister, Aunt Camille, <clears throat> who is gonna be doing the soloist tonight, it ran in the family. Her family growing up was all about singing and joy. And that's what I hope to relate in this, is that this service is all about joy. We are very happy that she is gone. We are sad for ourselves, but she is in a better place. She grew up in Mississippi and Louisiana. I guess that's where the Southern uh, hospitality, the Southern lady kind of grew from. Um, she graduated from LSU with a sociology degree. And um, she lived through the Depression, and I think that's what helped her um, foster her down-to-earth attitude. When she graduated from LSU, she joined the Girl Scouts in uh, Shreveport and then later here in Houston, and she was director of camping and helped found some of the, church, uh, some of the camps that our kids were able to go to when they got older. She married later in life, I think it was around 34, if I'm not correct, I think it was around 34, she got married to my dad, and that was older at that time. And when my dad asked her to marry him, her first sentence that I remember her saying was, well, can I quit my job now? I'm ready to have children. I'm ready to start a family. She had Heather when she was about 36, and she had me when she was 39, and my sister Holly when she was about 40. About six months after Holly was born, she had her first stroke. She was numb from the left side of her body. And I never really noticed it growing up except when she would cook. She had a tendency to put her hand on a burner and leave it there. And we would smell it and we would say, Mom, take your hand off the burner, please. My dad bought a farm in 1972 that we spent a lot of time going to. Um, he bought it without telling my mom or seeing it. 
And uh, when we were driving up there that day, my mom would say, does it, does it look like that? He'd say, no. Does it look like that? And she, he'd say, no. He'd say, Gene, it's not River Oaks. <laughs> so when we got there, I think my mom looked around, saw the house, and found a chair on the porch and just started crying. And when she was through crying, she stood up and fell through the porch. But that was okay. Because I think her Girl Scout training really kind of kicked in at that time. She was used to the primitive life. And as a family, we developed it and built it into something we were all proud of. Um, Mom killed lots of snakes that she wasn't worried about. She got bit by a scorpion. And she, all she did was say, well, let's just put some meat tenderizer on it. We'll be okay. And then she just kept going. Um, when we first got there, we didn't have running water, didn't have a bathroom, had an outhouse. I think it was that way for about five or ten years until we finally fixed that. And then uh, around um, 1993, my dad developed pancreatic cancer, and my mom became a caregiver. She would never left his side. She went with him to MD Anderson, stayed at home, and she was with him probably for about the six months, day in and day out, taking care of him. Um, after my dad passed away, that's all she had known before then was her family, her kids, her friends. She kind of had to recreate herself. So she ended up selling the house that we'd lived in for 20 some odd years and moved into an apartment and went back to her first love, the church and the choirs. She vowed never to watch sports again, is one of the first promises she made to me, especially basketball. She said, I've watched enough to last my whole life, and I'm not doing that anymore. She made new friends here at Memorial Drive, and she loved singing. She loved being with the church and the Wednesday night, and she would write people little notes about what they had talked about if she didn't really agree or one that she wanted to learn about a little bit more. But she was always trying to develop and be better for herself. And I was very proud of her for starting her life over again after my dad had passed away. One of her greatest um, joys in those later years were her grandchildren. My dad never knew our children, but my mom made sure that everyone remembered them, and she loved every one of you. Later in life, when she, uh, about a year and a half ago, she moved in with Heather, and I really want to thank Heather's family for taking care of my mom. Steve, you were unbelievable with her, and I really, really appreciate it. Ashlyn and Emmy, when you uh, would come home from school and go see her, she would, who knew what she was going to say? <laughs> but I really appreciate that, and we uh, are truly thankful for your family and taking care of my mom and making sure that the last year and a half of her life was with loved ones. My mom was a Southern lady. She had this beautiful Southern drawl, but she couldn't ever say my name. She thought my name was Reggie Howwood. She couldn't ever pronounce it. And I said, when I had my son, um, Ryan, she goes, I think that is a beautiful name, Ron. I go, who is Ron? It's Ryan. So she had this beautiful way of saying things that I will never really forget. Um, every night when my dad came home, before, she came, before he came home, she would always go in and put on makeup, freshen up for my dad coming home. She would always make sure the house was spotless because she wanted to present her house to her husband. That's something I will never, ever forget. She had one of her second strokes, probably 2011 or so, and um, she went to rehab. 
for about nine months. She was not ever expected to walk again or talk again. They didn't know my mom. She didn't know, they didn't know that she thought a Southern lady would not have a walker. And she vowed that she would be able to walk again. And she did it after about nine months. We always had dinner at 6.30 at night. It was always dinner and dessert. My dad had a pretty big sweet tooth and I think we kind of carried on with the rest of our family. And I never really realized until I got married that uh, rolls actually have bottoms because whenever my mom cooked, she would always cut those off because they were burned. <laughs> but she would read the paper from front to back every day. And at dinner, we would discuss what she had read and what my dad had read. And our dinner was usually about two or two and a half hours every night. We talk about current events, politics, and any and all things. And we learned a lot through those talks. She was an unbelievable writer. She wrote her mother every Sunday afternoon for as long as she was, until her mother passed away. She wrote letters to us all the time. Obviously, she told me what I was supposed to say. She read books and loved to read. Um, she read books of all kinds. Romance was one of her ones, Christian biographies, everything. But I think one of her favorite writing or things that she read was People Magazine. And at our farm, we actually wallpapered our bathroom with old People Magazine covers. I'm not real sure why, but she was a very blunt lady. Either she would tell you what she was thinking or you got the message from her face. Um, she never raised her voice. She didn't have to. Whenever we would get into trouble, all she'd say is just wait till your father gets home. <laughs> she really hated talking on the phone. And when she would call you up, she would tell you exactly what she wanted you to know on that phone, and then she'd say, hmm, someone's at the door, I gotta go. <laughs> Our conversations usually lasted about one or two minutes, which was fine with me. There was one time when my uh, children were young, um, and they were acting up, or at least I thought they were acting up, and um, my mom was there, and I was trying to talk to them about why they had acted up and probably not doing the best job of it, and, my child looked at me like, what are, you, what are you doing? Just that angry look and just, mom looked at me and she said, Reggie, I don't think it's working. <laughs> you need to change what you're doing, but uh, I've gotta go now, so I'll see you later. <laughs> um, she was very protective of all of us. You know, in, in my life specifically, I've had some big issues that I've had to go through. And she always gave me comfort and protected me. She had the most beautiful blue eyes, and when she would look at you, she would, you would see her love. She was very proud of her family and embellished everything we did. So if you've talked to her about us, I'm very sorry. And whatever she told you is not true. <laughs> it was kind of fun for us to ask my mom what we did for a living and um, it was always fun to listen to what she had said because she was completely wrong <laughs> she thought we were running the company and that everyone loved us and whether we were running a school or anything like that but it was really fun for us to listen about how she would embellish about all of our accomplishments I really tried to figure out what I, her hobbies were. And I had a hard time figuring that out. But then it kind of hit me. Her hobbies were whatever we did. Her hobby was going to the farm, going to a sporting event, making us dinner, loving us, and of course singing. She loved it. 
And I will say that uh, she was always a teacher. She taught us how to live. And as we saw, she taught us how to die. The last week of her life, um, something happened on Wednesday. We don't know if it was a stroke or what it was. But she could not communicate and could not move, except for her eyes. And we would sit and talk to her and tell her it was okay to go and we were gonna be okay. And she would stare at you with those blue eyes. I never realized how much someone can communicate with their eyes. We would talk to her and I would say that I had to leave and I'd be back the next morning and she'd have a little tear come out of her eye. She was so lucid, so understanding those last couple days. She was peaceful and she was content. She had lived a great life. And I really just want to thank my mom for all my lessons she taught us. I love you. Job well done. Thank you.
And I know he watches me. How lovely. That was beautiful. Thank you. I know Jean is smiling. Before I begin, I want to say that I may uh, step on a few of Reggie's remarks, but I'm going to uh, take a hint from Jean and I may just embellish them a bit. Is that okay? As I begin to think of this service and how we might best celebrate Jean's life, a certain theatrical role came into my mind. And not surprisingly, as Jean commanded any stage that she might find herself upon. Last summer, my husband and I binge watched the PBS series Downton Abbey. I had watched a few of the earlier episodes when it first began, but at the time was still on staff here at the church. And by Sunday evening at 8 o'clock, I was barely responsive. But now that I'm living the life of leisure, I actually have time for such pleasures. We weren't far into the series before we became enamored with Maggie Smith's performance as Violet Crawley, the Dowager Countess of Grantham. She's simply a delight to watch. I'm hoping you've seen this. You see, Violet symbolizes the old world, and sometimes has difficulty accepting change. She's an aristocrat through and through, a matriarchal figure with a quick wit despite her age. Uh, she's immensely proud of her son and loves her granddaughters very much. At heart, Violet is a kind woman who has less trouble in accepting people for their worth than she likes to admit. She usually acts with more than one motive in mind, but she always seeks to protect and care for her family. And when the dowager glides into a room, ornate cane in hand, I see Jean Howard. Think about it, there's some similarities. Jean had those piercing blue electric eyes and her presence was felt the moment she walked into any room, and she had those endearing, engaging, southern sensibilities that shaped most anything she did. I can say that. I'm from Mississippi, too. She had compassion, sharp wit, and intellect, a zest for being direct and pragmatic, and an aura of the past that drew us in and made us want to know more and experience it somehow through her eyes. I liked Jean Howard from the moment I met her. She was so smart and such a delight to be with. She was part of our Listening for God class for a couple of years and she added so much. When Jim and I were visiting with the family the other day, I told them about some random discussion we were having one day in class and Jean referred to some group by saying, they, they just aren't in the same echelon as we are at this church. I couldn't remember the last time I'd even heard the word echelon. Now, you have to admit that sounds a tiny bit aristocratic, but the comparison to the dowager Countess of Grantham evaporates when we realize what a genuinely authentic person Jean was. Not a character created by pen and ink. She was flesh and blood, heart and soul. Yes, she did appreciate refinement and decorum, but at heart she was such a caring person, someone who regardless of what might be going on in her own life, took time to encourage others. I know firsthand how it felt to get an uplifting note, a favorite book, or some much needed word of encouragement for Jean, from Jean. And I liked it that she especially supported women. Sorry, Jim. The families that we grow up in, the values that are instilled in us, the love that we receive, these are the things that shape us 
and mold us into what we become. And this was so true of Jean. She grew up in a wonderful family. As you heard, it all began in Delo, Mississippi, Delo, Mississippi, along with brothers Jack and Paul and sisters Mary Sue and Camille. Jean learned what it meant to be a real family. Times were simpler then, and just being together was enough to make life significant and special. This tight-knit family weathered the Depression, sheltered from the harsh reality of those times by a doting, loving mother. Laughter and, as you heard, music were constants in their household. And before long, things began to look up, and after the Depression, they found themselves resettled and thriving in Monroe, Louisiana. After graduation from high school there, Jean headed to LSU, where she graduated with that degree in sociology, which led to a career with the Girl Scouts of America, first in Shreveport and then in Houston, where life and love awaited her. Jean's work with the Girl Scouts was quite remarkable. As director of camping, she managed the purchasing, developing, and functioning of several established Girl Scout camps in this area. And I didn't even know this about Jean, but I'm not really surprised. I bet those Girl Scouts also learned about proper manners. But I would say that her most significant accomplishment in Houston was catching the, uh, the eye of Vane Howard. Am I pronouncing that right? As I looked at it, I thought, do I have it right? Vane, I love that. A fellow member of the Young Republicans and an up-and-coming attorney in Houston. Their common interest in politics was an immediate attraction, and soon they were seeing musicals and going to movies and spending lots of simple time together. Of course, we heard the outcome for those young Republicans. They were married and soon started a dynamic family. And I have to just stop at this point and say that I am so relieved that your mother never learned I was a Democrat. <laughs> Sorry, Jean. In fact, that family, those children, are the true testament what, to what Jean Howard's life was about. As you heard earlier, uh, that comment of now, can I quit my job? I love that. She was ready for that family. She was ready to devote her time and her energy and a heart to these children. And that's exactly what she did. I've never met a family so full of confidence and joy and laughter. As strange as it may sound, and it does sound strange, it was actually fun to sit and hear those stories the other day that Reggie and Heather and Holly shared, I know that Jean was laughing too, for she was intent that this be a joy-filled celebration of her life. And I'm fairly sure that if we could stop right now and listen to each one of you, you would have a Jean Howard story to share. And though we appreciate her intellect and her great love of books and people, and her honed skill at saying the direct thing that needed to be said in any given situation, we also appreciate the humor attached to most all of those stories. For Jean Howard had a wonderful, sometimes wry, sometimes a little caustic sense of humor. Laughter can indeed be a healing gift. And though our hearts are sad this day that a loving and bright light has gone out of our lives, we are also comforted by remembering all the wonderful times that Jean shared with us. In actuality, Reverend Dr. Susie Reedstrom was supposed to be giving these words today. I am a stand-in. But I have to tell you that over the years, Susie and I have laughed often at the encounters we had with Jean regarding this very service. Susie was to give the words of comfort and assurance, and I was to read scripture. In fact, every time that we saw Jean, she would remind us. We were not to forget. Some days it was hard to sort of focus on her living when she was so intent on planning her dying. She loved Susie Reedstrom, as we all do. 
The Wednesday night service here that Susie leads was dear to her heart. And though you might find Jean here on a Sunday morning, Wednesday night was her true time of worship. When Susie realized she could not be here today, I asked her what she might say if she were here, and this is what she sent to me. I would want to say how encouraging Jean was to me. I could count on a note from her telling me how great my sermon was. She was such a reader and loved to give me books that she had read, telling me why I should read them. She always spoke her mind, whether you wanted to hear it or not. An intelligent woman who took life on and didn't let others deter her. I'm thankful to have known her and called her friend. And I'm sure that we can all say ditto to that. I know that I can. Jean did take life on, and she didn't let circumstances deter her. I marveled the other afternoon, and as you heard it today, when I learned that her first stroke took place when Holly was two months old, I didn't know that. Can you imagine? Three young children and having to learn to talk and walk and manage a household again, but that's exactly what she did. Our learning, as you heard, I love the farm story, that your husband has brought, uh, bought you and surprised you with, not exactly what you might consider an idyllic farm. We laughed hard the other day about that. Hearing the story of driving past farm after farm, I can just imagine that she was thinking, is this it? No. Is this it? No only to arrive at that farm that you might say needed a little TLC and a perhaps good snake handler, but she was not deterred. She put on her happy face after the chair incident, rolled up her sleeves, and began the labor-intensive work of reshaping that little farm. I think you all were the work crew. I'm sure her Girl Scouting background came in handy, and I suppose we could sort of think of that place as Camp Howard. It was enjoyed and loved by the entire family for years, and I'm sure that the experiences there were part of the glue that helped hold you together as a family and helped shape those young children into the competent and caring adults that they have become. Because Jean was so strong in her faith, so confident in God's promises, I don't have any sense that I need to somehow say some hugely profound words of assurance to this family, for I know that Jean instilled all of that certainty into each one of you. Her honesty, her integrity, her passion, all those qualities influenced you as you grew up, for you saw her fully, fully becoming the person that God had created her to be. So on this day, we do celebrate a life well lived, a life lived in grace and generosity, a life lived without compromise, a life that will serve as a source of inspiration and encouragement for all her adult children and her grandchildren as they become all that God created them to be. It's now your job to keep that spirit alive to tell her stories and to research and maintain that family history that she treasured so much. And so, to Heather and Steve, to Reggie and Susie, to Holly and Howard, to grandchildren Ashlyn, Emerson, Reagan, Kendall, Ryan, Morgan, and Hunter, to siblings Mary Sue, Camille, Jack, and Paul, and to all other family members, we do offer our deepest condolences we recognize that this is a huge loss in your family, and we grieve with you. At the same time, however, we do joyfully celebrate all that Jean's life has meant to so many people. We are grateful for her presence in our lives. With you, we rejoice in the certain knowledge that Jean is fully Jean again, that any shadow of illness has been lifted, that she is in God's presence where she will remain forever, heaven is a brighter place. We are encouraged and embrace Jesus' words to his first disciples as he prepared them for his departure. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that's so that where I am, there you may be also. And when Thomas asked how were they to know the way if they didn't even know where Jesus was going, he responded, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. So without fear or doubt, we give Jean Howard back to God, knowing that God has prepared for Jean and for us a dwelling place far lovelier than we can ever imagine. We trust Jean to God's eternal care and then we honor her by the way we conduct our own lives. To those who remain here, to those who loved her dearly and those she in, in turn loved dearly, especially her family, I say these words that I say to every family in this situation. Honor Jean by living full and complete lives. Strive to become all get, that God created you to be. For what we are is God's gift to us, but what we become is our gift to God. Learn, work, play. When you can, laugh again, a lot and often. Make deep and good friendships. Be forgiving and ask for forgiveness. Serve others, for Christ himself came as a servant. Care about the things that will make the world a better place. And remember, for surely memory, along with laughter, is a healing gift from God. Remember all that Jean meant to you and all that you were to her. Cherish those memories and know that she, above all else, would want you to continue the lives that for many years you shared. Now, for the first time ever in a memorial service, I have this strong sense of, I hope we got this right. I hope Jean is smiling with us and celebrating us the way we are celebrating her. Somehow, I know she is. And if she could, I think she might share these words from Isla Paschal Richardson. Grieve not, nor speak of me with tears, but laugh and talk of me as if I was beside you. I loved you so, t'was heaven here with you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I'm sorry. Are you going to do that? Okay. If you would, turn in your bulletins to the prayer of thanksgiving, and let us pray this prayer together. We give thanks and praise for Jean, who has served you in faithfulness and love, and who dwells forever in your presence. Grant that all the good we have seen and known in her may continue to inspire and guide us. May we always love her and hallow her memory, and that when we have fulfilled our time on earth, we may have part with her in thy heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.
Our closing hymn is number 431, Let There Be Peace on Earth, Let Us Stand As We Sing. Part of our celebration is about to conclude, but certainly the celebration of Jean's life will continue. So on behalf of Heather and Reggie and Holly and all of the family, I invite you to join them in the reception over in our friendship court. As you go out the doors to the back, just turn left and go straight to the, to the next building and there it will be. Now, would you receive the benediction that I like to do as a blessing with heads raised and eyes opened? And now, may God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you and the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit may it be with you to abide you, uphold you, give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.